Hello and welcome to Upstream Intelligence webinar on automated decision making in directional drilling brought to you by Reuters Events. My name is Jade Waters. Um, I work as an analyst at Reuters Events as well as being this year's project director for the Data Driven Drilling and Production Conference taking place in Houston this June, which we have produced um, this webinar in conjunction with. Uh, this webinar is just one of several pieces of work we're doing to produce to promote the industry and some of the key issues within it. There are over 500 of you signed up today, so thanks very much for the great response, and thank you in advance to our panelists for their time. Just a brief bit of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar will last around 50 minutes to an hour and is being recorded, so we will send you the full audio recordings and presentations within a week or so. Um, you do have the facility to ask questions, with our, which our chair and I will navigate, and there will also be some live polls as we move through the session. The purpose of today's session is really to take a closer look at the digital solutions within drilling. Are these solutions commercially viable? What are the biggest challenges in bringing automation in? And how does automation fit into the existing drilling team structure, as well as much, much more, I'm sure. Um, joining me today um, are speakers um, to address some of the key issues are Kelsey Prestige, who is a former drilling engineer at Chevron, and Data Science Manager Ding Zhao Kao, who has recently moved to WPX Energy. All of the organizations involved today will be speaking in Houston this June, so if you'd like to meet them in person, then please do join us there by registering at www upstreamintel.com slash data. Uh, do remember, if at any point you want to ask the panelists a question, then you can simply enter this into the text box and we'll try to address it in the Q&A at the end. So without further ado, it's time to bring on Mark Anderson, who is a managing member and consultant at Anderson and Stillman, who will be our chair for the session today. Uh, Mark, over to you. Great, Mark Anderson here. I hope everyone can hear me. If not, please uh, send a little uh, chat and, and let me know how I'm doing. I spent 37 years with Shell, my job before I left uh, at the end of uh, 2018 was as Shell Manager at Drilling Mechanics Technologies. In our group, we uh, helped our well delivery teams uh, implement, deploy, and then provide technical service uh, with our well delivery teams around the globe. And uh, today my job is really just to, uh, to help uh, Dinjo and Kelsey uh, talk about their projects and try to uh, enlighten all of us about automated decision making in directional drilling. Two things are really going on right now uh, and, and they overlap. One is uh, digitalization and automation in directional drilling and the second is going remote directional drilling where people are removed from the uh, rig site and working in, in centers. So think of it as telecommuting to, to the rig. With that, uh, uh, Din Jo and then Kelsey will give a short uh, uh, presentation of their of their of their work, and they'll introduce themselves more. And with that, I'd like to turn over to uh, Dean Cho. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dean from WPS. Uh, yeah, I just uh, moved from Anadarko to WSPS. Uh, everybody know what happened to Anadarko, so but it's a happy ending for us. So uh, for me, actually, I'm not a junior drilling guy. Actually, I've doesn't like Mark or Kelsey, I'm a data science guy. So my, my perspective will make more focus on data scientists. Uh, I was in the data science or like what, what we don't have, we call that not data science at that time. For almost 15 years, I stepped into uh, machine learning when I was in a bachelor back to 2004 and continue my, continue my master in uh, machine learning research in the financial market and then uh, after that, I come to US for my PhD program in Michigan and uh, get a uh, PhD in the industrial engineer. And finally, I, I joined uh, 
a BP as the first job in the oil and gas. Uh, and I moved to Anadarko, and finally I ended up with WPS three days or four days ago. Uh, my in in my work in Anadarko, what I actually do actually is we we build a real time drilling system, analytic system. We 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 build a platform that bring in the real time data into the office and in the between we build a lot of machine learning and advanced analytics model to do analysis. Uh, directional, directional drilling is actually one of our domain, but we haven't put any product, uh, model into production due to some of the concerns. Uh, I can talk later in detail, uh, but uh, I can see that, yeah, uh, automate the directional drilling process actually is the trend for right now. So that's my uh, short uh, introduction. Yeah, I will hand back to Mark right now. Mark? Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And and now, uh, Kelsey, can you uh, uh, give us a, a brief update on, on yourself and your projects? Sure, no problem. So hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Prestige. I am currently working as a drilling engineer for Chevron in our Permian Basin business unit. Um, in my previous role, I was responsible for staging up the MCBU, which is our Mid-Continent Business Unit Remote Directional Drilling Center. Um, and so to give a little bit more background on me, I started my career in 2012 after graduating from Texas A&M University, where I studied petroleum engineering. I have about two years of offshore experience in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the Gulf of Thailand. Um, in 2014, I moved to uh, the Permian Basin, um, worked as a company representative out in the field for about five and a half years, and then transitioned into, um, at Chevron, we have something called the Max Drill Team, which is about BIT and BHA optimization. Um, so joined that team and then recently moved into a drilling uh, engineering role. And to give a little bit of background on uh, Chevron stance in the Permian. So in 2016, we set out on a journey to investigate inconsistencies and what was impacting our overall fleet. Uh, through that investigation, we determined that there was a lot of inconsistencies in how we go about execution. So we developed uh, very robust standardized operating procedures. So we, we worked through those operating procedures for a couple of years. Um, and then back in 2018, in March, we set out on a journey to understand how do we further optimize our operations. Um, and so we also had a digital transformation push at the beginning of 2018. So we thought it was a good opportunity for us as a business unit to truly lean in and use digital technology, technologies to deliver value and truly set our operations apart. Um, so as of Today, we are currently running 100% of our drilling operations in the Permian from our remote center in Houston. Um, we have a few rover teams set up throughout the, the field, which I'll talk a little bit more through the, through the discussion today. But just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background uh, from our side. Okay, uh, very, very, very interesting. Um, so, 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 Kelsey, can you explain uh, for for someone who is familiar with uh, with uh, drilling, but not particularly a remote center, what are what are the the sort of the roles between the rig and a remote center? Okay, sure. So traditionally, dr directional drillers are located on the rig site and were responsible for driving. Uh, the performance at that specific rig and the directional drillers were only responsible for that one rig in particular. So as I mentioned earlier, this this resulted in multiple ideas of of what was good what, what good was looking like because we had standard operating procedures that were in place, but we still saw some inconsistencies on how we were actually going about executing. Um, so as I mentioned. From our remote center, we have all of our directional work going on. Um, so what that means is we've pulled off our directional drillers from location. 
Um, we've staged up rover teams that are established in the field to support field-based operations. Um, and they're responsible for picking up our bottom hole assemblies, laying down our bottom hole assemblies, uh, troubleshooting any issues, mentoring new field personnel and things of that nature. Um, so it's just a little bit different um, through the pro or through the transition. We had to work um, pretty di diligently on developing workflows so that when we made the transition to remote, it would be a seamless change um, in addressing some of the concerns about pulling people off location and what that was going to look like. Um, okay, uh, uh, very, very good. And the role of the MWD operator is, uh, is there one still available? Are you uh, doing that again from the uh, your remote center? So we're also doing that from our remote center as well. And then the communications from the remote center to the rig is done by the phone and text and email and that sort of thing? So we are using uh, essentially push to talk phones, which is, which is a walkie talkie type system. Uh, our drillers have them on the rig floor. We have uh, directional drillers in the remote center and we communicate back and forth through there. Um, in addition to that, in order to continue to have the directional drillers engaged with our operations, we also started using um, some chat features uh, so that we were able to get geology, superintendents, drilling engineers, everyone involved with the bigger picture of the drilling operation engaged, um, as well as continuously uh, looping in the directional drillers so that they were aware of what was going on in the field. So we, we kind of had to navigate around what did what do we need to do and how do we interface with DDs once we decide to pull them pull them off of a rig? You know that's a, a, a very interesting uh, learning that uh, we had in Shell is when we were first going to remote centers in, in the Gulf of Mexico and the center would uh, communicate directly with the driller and cut out the company man, then, the, then the, the operator's company man on location would be unaware of what was going on. And, and that, that turned uh, uh, very, uh, it, it didn't work well. So we had to make sure that we would keep uh, everyone in the loop and especially the, uh, the other supervisory staff on, on the rig site. So I guess your, your workflows, you've, you've really made sure that they're included in, the, uh, in, that, in that communications uh, um, uh, setup that you have. Yeah, because a lot of the challenges and push that, pushbacks that we had was we had to overcome the quote unquote, this is how we've always done it. I don't like change mentality. And we all know that change is never easy and we're all creatures of habit, especially people in drilling. <laughs> Um, so we knew going into the transition that change management was critical to the, to the success of this project. Um, and I was reading some statistics uh, a couple of days ago, and it actually says that 54% of all change initiatives actually fail, which in my opinion is a pretty huge number. And so going into, going into our project and the transition, we had to be really cognizant of having a clearly defined problem that we were actually going into face, um, leading with our Chevron way behaviors, involving every layer of management from multiple groups to understand how it was going to impact the different workflows. Because not, it's not only impacting drilling, it's also impacting our uh, geology and uh, below, uh, below surface people, as well as our decision support center. So how would we interface that um, we also had to establish collaborative teams and just help maintain constant transparent communication with all the parties. Because um, a lot of times people communicate things, but communication is not the same as engagement. So when we were trying to start the process and roll it out, we actively got feedback from our drill site representatives, our directional drillers, the coordinators, 
um, to understand what we were actually needing and what their concerns were and how we would address those concerns so that we were able to pull off those directional drillers from locations. So we made frequent visits out to the field to roll it out, ensuring that the process we were establishing made sense. And if it didn't make sense, we would go back to the drawing board and say, okay, hey, what do we need to do to make this happen? Um, and I think the one success or the one thing that made us really, really successful as a team was we were very collaborative, but we also had the same why. And our team was empowered to make decisions from our leadership team to make remote directional drilling uh, successful. Um, we weren't afraid to fail. We came into the, the conversation together and said, this is what we're wanting to do. We've never done this before. Uh, we'll lean on you, you lean on us, but we'll help each other um, along the way. So I think that was, that was pretty important for us to be able to do what we did. Oh, very, a very interesting journey. Thanks, thanks for those insights. Uh, there, there is a question about uh, remote uh, sense, uh, remote uh, software being proprietary. Uh, uh, some of them just uh, asked that, but I'd like to ask that one uh, to uh, Din Joe with his uh, days at uh, Anadarko about um, uh, the the the. Uh, mathematics, the, the, the computer programs, the, the algorithms, uh, uh, you built your own uh, data uh, into directional drilling type uh, uh, software environment. Uh, why, uh, you, you did that and what would be the advantages and disadvantages as opposed to buying that from a vendor? Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, actually, uh, my my domain is a little it's, uh, more than just the director drilling. So uh, I'm more, uh, I'm not just focused on that one, but uh, I just talking the project what we did in Anadarko. So actually, actually the uh, let me put in this way: the we build a real-time analytic system internally in Anadarko and. Uh, Directional, directional drilling advises algorithm, actually one of them, one of the model in the system. Uh, and uh, I know Marcus' question is uh, just about the directional drilling, uh, directional drilling algorithm, but actually what I want to talk is about the whole package of the, the real-time drilling analytic system. Because in the market, we also had a COA or line mobilized in the, in, in the market. And also for the directional during algorithm before we have motive right now the HP in and also we have other small company they also provide the kind of software. Uh, why I want to say that the benefit of building some of this analytic system internally in the operator is because we can customize the system within our internal data foundation. Uh, uh, one of the Example I can put here is like is not the directional tuning, but let's say the talking gen model. One of the projects I did in Anarcho, we try to put the talking gen model in a automate and a real time mode. That means every time when a survey available in the field, in the rig, in the office, the software will recalculate the talking gen model and pro again the pro again the 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 hook law or other real time uh uh management and to see whether the chain is is changed so that we can see whether the hole is clean or we will get the stuff even or not. But the biggest challenge is how we can get all the information automatically into the into the into the system so that the model can be calculated automatically. So I spent at least more than 12 months trying to build the foundation like how to get the BHA information, how to get the whole information automatically and how to get the uh, the Julian Pi information automatically so we can dump into the Tau inject model. So that's the foundation. But if we, if it's a third party, let's say Cova or Mobileye, they know where because they cannot provide one solution for all the company because maybe uh, Shell had different kind of data foundation internally to save the data. And maybe Chevron had different one, Anandarko had different one, and WPS had different one. So actually, 
from my perspective, my view is like in the third party, they cannot provide this kind of software, except that you get the whole package from one company, let's say it's Lumberjay or Halliburton, they give you the whole package you know, from the well design to finally the do the well and to the abandoned well, you use the one suite from Slumberjay or from Halliburton, then you have the real time uh, system, uh, a talk engine model. But if you just try to use the Kova or like mobilize, there's no way you can automate this stuff. So that's one of benefit we can, in the operator side, if you can build something internally, internally, you can customize to automate the workflow and customize to, to automate the, the process and finally get the algorithm automate. Because the biggest feelings for me when I was in another circle is not just the algorithm. A lot of times it's how you deploy your algorithm or data science model into the workflow. So that makes the automate so that the junior engineer doesn't need to do anything, just click the button or just go to the, your UI that can see the result. That's what we proceed for. So that's one of the benefits. Uh, let's go back to the director dueling algorithm. Actually worked with uh, UT Austin, the rapid uh, lab, that's uh, Dr. Ardis, uh lab. We do have, uh, we do develop some of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, we call the director dueling advisor algorithm. What it do is that it will tell you when to slide, when to rotate, and how many, if it's a mag motor, we, we're talking about the mag motor. When, when, you, when, when you're going to slide, when you're going to, uh, to, to rotate, and how many feet you're going to slide in with the, uh, uh, with the degree. So that's the algorithm doing. Uh, it's a great uh, algorithm, but finally we cannot make it to production. The reason why is because uh, Anadarko doesn't set up in the way of like Shell or Shellroom talking about uh, the remote uh, support center. In Anadarko, we don't have this kind of stuff and we don't want to set up this kind of stuff. So actually that come back to a reliability issue. So in the rig side, we have a company man or, or we to in charge of uh, represent the company to, to supervise everything there and uh, and all the reliability go to the complement if something gets wrong. So the direct you law will listen to the complement. Right now, if an adaco development uh, algorithm and tell the jewel how to do the well, and if finally we had an issue with the well, who is this disability? So that's the that's the one of the issues we face when we are in an adaco try to de deploy this model. But in Shell or Sharon, they don't have the problem because they have the the remote support center, they may just the director or, or company name will see in the direct uh, the remote support center. They still they can solve this problem in this way. But in another we didn't set up that way. That's finally the algorithm is very good, but I never go to into a production in the in our real time doing analytic system. So that's the that's another topic I'm I'm talking about. Uh, maybe it's out of that Topic about what market's question, but that's the key is like buying from the market or building internally, they all have pros and cons. And another thing I want to talk about is building internally system and uh, uh, and buying for the market is also have another uh, benefits like or like pros and cons like, uh, let me put it this way, in the market way, let's say COA cost you 300 or mobile cost you $300 each day, each week. Uh, that's the rate. And if you have 10 rig, it's $1 million each year. You need to pay cover or mobile or other third party. Uh, if you have 60 rigs for some of the company, the big one, then you need to pay 6 million each year. But if you build one of the system internally, once you build it, it's just a maintenance. The cost is very low. So it depends on how how many recon you have. The more recon, the more benefit you can get from building internally. Uh, uh, but but there is a bug here. If you have six recon, sixty recon, or like fifty, there is not that easy. you will have a lot of let's say big company problem. So it's not that easy to build and then roll out to production. So even in Anadarko, we had like 17 to 10 rig at that time. It's the middle side. 
and we can build a system and load to production. But I can imagine if it's the super major, they have more than 50, 40, 30, 40 or 50, there are a lot of big company problem and different kind of opinion. And finally, the project will fail. I can see that because I see that several company like Conical Ferries, like Oxy or like Marathon, they want to do the same thing, but finally they don't end up good. So that's why uh, that's another problem come. If your company is too big, if you don't have strong leadership to support the project, it's harder for you to build something and roll out the production. That's the feeling. That's why when I <laughs> choose a company, I choose WPS. It's a small company in the decent side. So I build something, I can load production. So that's another comment. This may be out of topic, but that's related to dueling and data science or analytics. Uh, that's my uh, question, uh, answer. Back to you, uh, Mark. Okay, uh, very, very interesting that that uh, uh, fairly technical uh, uh, answer ended up with change management, which was exactly what Kelsey was talking about with uh, with the change management. That it's not really the tools as as much the uh, the change management and getting getting the, uh, the the staff on the rig and then in your remote centers and the people are going to be using these tools to 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 actually use them and do something differently very interesting we have many uh, questions that have come up so so I'm going to jump over from the scripted questions to try to take our audience's questions and there's one from David Lee I think that Kelsey could probably uh, answer this the best um, which is, uh, uh, are you taking real-time data with a data integrator system and making geosteering decisions and well-planning changes without interrupting the uh, the operations? So those are some things that we're looking into. So one of the challenges that we have right now, and I think it's across any industry that's going through a quote-unquote digital transformation, is we're taking in so much data but what do you actually do with that data and how do you interpret that data to help you make better, uh, more efficient uh, data-driven decisions? So we are kind of exploring that, but just as yet, we're not, we're not doing that. Uh, okay, so then, uh, so you're not doing geostream. Uh, I know from our oh, show so we, days, are doing we did geostream. have the ge I thought you geo were, uh, Sorry, we're doing geo steering. I thought they were mentioning automated geo steering. Okay, right. So the geo steering is still done uh, by uh, by geo steer, so a directional driller and a geo steer, uh, and that's uh, and are they both sitting in the remote center? Yes. So for us, uh, our remote center, we have what we call pods set up. Um, so we have a directional drilling pod, and then an MWD pod, and then a geo steering pod, and they're all centrally located. So they're constantly having communication about what's going on, what do we need to change, um, helping to drive some of those decisions to make them more data driven, rather than this is this is what I've always done or this is how I feel type decisions. So there are more open communications that are going on, having them all in the same area. So then the communications between the geosteers and the directional drillers uh, are, are enhanced because they're sitting in the same location as opposed to when the directional driller was on location and he'd be emailing and then receiving emails back. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So one of, one of the advantages is having all those people centrally and then if there was a question they could call in the geologist and sit down and have a five or ten minute discussion and, and decide a, a course of action rather than trying to get everyone on email um, and uh, and so the, uh, the the questions are resolved much quicker that's that's something that we saw in uh, in shell in our remote centers as well yeah because I mean in the past each party would be making the best decision that they thought they could with the information that they had and so we we're operating in silos and since bringing them, bringing them into the remote center, we've been able to see 
where the old decision making patterns ultimately impacted our efficiency. So we've seen a significant improvement in the opportunity of having open communication, increasing the collaboration between the geosteers that are interacting with the drilling operations teams, um, asset development as well. So there, there's several moving parts in there um, that have kind of helped us drive the benefit that we're seeing with the remote center. Because we like to look at the remote center sure. in another way. It's more of like a process control system that enables consistent repeatable wells. It's removing the process variables or at least trying to ensure that we're following, following a procedure that's prescribed. Okay, great. Going on to the uh, questions that we've received, there's one uh, for, uh, for, for Kelsey, but uh, Din Joe can also jump in on this. And what's the role of data standards such as WITSML and the new data transfer protocols play in making remote operations successful? And are there any uh, standards that, uh, that, uh, that we need to uh, develop uh, going for, uh, forward? So that is a really good Kelsey, question. Do you want to take that one first? Uh, sure. So that's a really good question. So I don't do a lot of work with the data standards. I would have to link you guys up with Patrick McCormick from our Decision Support Center. He is well versed with all of that. But um, going back to the question, there is a challenge with how these different systems interface. And it kind of goes on to what Ding Zhu was talking about earlier is right now we kind of have a hodgepodge of different um, different companies that are working on different systems and then the corporation that you're working for itself might have uh, different ways of saving data and how do we interface those uh, those data systems together so that you can use data analytics to understand more of what you're doing and make those data just data driven decisions so in the future I see it coming um, sooner rather than later but I I can't speak to the data standards directly. Um, I would have to point to someone else. Uh, I can't ask some. Okay. Well, then, then Joe, can you? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to ask you to jump in, and you, you beat me to it. <laughs> OK. Yeah, because uh, for the, when we're talking about the Data analysis in the during, we talking about two kind of data. One is real time data. Real time data as it is the sensor data we get from the 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 rig or the the service or the downhole. That one I think for the time being we use the VictorMail. I see one of the question for me here. Uh, why we don't use the VictorMail standard to improve the VHA? So let me put in this way. So. For the real-time data, the sensor data, we do use the VictorMail. We pull the data from NLV or Python, the data hub, so that we can get the uh, uh, real-time data in a 10 to 10 second delay. Uh, another one is like the static data we call actually is like the BHA uh, uh, and also like other well in related information. That one actually, I, I don't know whether they have a VictorMail standard for the BHA. But that's not important. The most important thing is like, depending on how is your workflow is look like. So let me put it this way. In, uh, in Anadarko, we use the open well. So open well is good at every single field for the duty engineer or some other well planner to put all the information in. But the reality is that data is not there. It's just the uh, I see the noise in the background. I'm not sure is any connection problem. Okay, so uh, the reality is like we had a software, or we had some of the good software in Anadarko or in like even BP before use the open well. We had uh, this one, but the reality is like the during engineer or the well planner, they don't use that software to do their work, the, the daily job. Like let's say one example is the well the well board diagram. Uh, you, uh, lot of, we have a lot of great software in the market, or even the OpenWell or the Compass can do the wellbore diagram, but they don't use it. What they use, actually, they use the Excel to do that. And finally, the Excel generate is not going to the OpenWell. So when you use that one, so you cannot get the BHA from the OpenWell. It's not a, 
in a database. So that's the issue. So it's not what I can say that is not actually not the standard available, or it's not a software or tool available. It's just like the workflow or the working process within each company is different from di even in the same company for different asset team or different of department, they are different. And they, that's a legacy issue. I don't want to keep comment that one. So, so in order for you to get the data to fit into the model, that's a big challenge. For example, let's say in another we had a Gulf Mexico asset team, and we also had onshore, US onshore, and some is international. Different asset team, they do that well data or well planning differently. And then the data spread in different format and different place. We do have uh, open well as the only repository for the well planning, but they don't use it. And finally, end up that the data is not in open well. And as the, uh, what we call the advanced analysis team, me, I don't want to push that because I'm not in the position to push everybody use that one. That's not the right battle I to fight for. So what I try to do is try to adapt to their what they are doing right now in the, their workflow and try to collect the data I need. So that's what I'm talking about. That's a big challenge uh, uh, for the static data, not the real-time data. So that that's my comment, and then I will give back the control to Mark. Yep. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, and I think that answers uh, Robert and Raymond's questions, and and a few other here. There's there's another very interesting question here from Aaron, talking about collaboration. Where collaboration sounds like it was critical. How you take the team to the next level with visualization, calculations, consistency, and decision making and execution? Kelsey, do you want to take that first? Sure. So um, when we were developing our collaborative teams, we also were very aware that a lot of people are very visual learners. They like to see things and able to in order to be able to understand them. Um, so we were constantly feeding them with data about what does our performance look like pre and post remote? How how is the the change impacting our work? So we are starting to look at um, data analytics dashboards that can be fed through your regular internet connection that's producing information about like ROP um, heat generate or uh, heat maps that are being generated off of uh, drilling parameters and things of that nature. So we're we're trying to give the give the people in the field that are making the decisions the data that they need in order to make those decisions and also make those decisions more efficiently whereas we're not having to spend a lot of time pulling um, offset well data so that we're able to analyze it to understand what we're seeing we have dashboards set up where we've got multiple offset wells pulled in is this what we're expecting with this range yes or no and then you can kind of make your decisions based off of that you know that uh there's another question here from sami talking about uh visualization uh since since i know sami from from my shell days i know that he'll always pitch uh, one of the more difficult questions so can you talk about the, the teamwork and relationship to visualization and how far along that that path you are? Uh, can you clarify the question? I'm not sure I understand what is being asked. Uh, yes, okay, so 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 we have data uh, flowing through, but but people are are visual uh, as you mentioned, and so, you have some uh, some suites out there. Corva is 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 the classic uh, tool out there that has really visual, very eloquent, where you can look at these these the the the, the visualization of the data, and you sort of intuitively understand, and that seems to help uh, the teamwork and people getting on the same page about what's going on in your operations. And so you were mentioning about visualization as as well, and how you sort of did the the the, the, the calculations, the numbers, the communications, and now you're layering in better and better visualization. So for us, we're starting to understand what those visualization. How? Let me 
rewind. So we're starting to use visualization, visualization, but one of the challenges with visualization, um, especially with a system like Corva, is you can have 400 million different uh, visualizations. But how do you how do you narrow down those visualizations to ultimately help you drive efficiencies and make sure that the people that are looking at it understand what you're actually looking at and how can you use those um, visualizations to drive your decision making. So essentially right now what we're doing is we're trying to validate uh, our visualizations to make sure that we're, we're feeding the field the information that they need to know so that they're, that they're able to look at those, interpret them, and then be able to make a decision based off of that. So based on the, our, uh, uh, my experience on the dark what we do actually is uh, for the visualization. It's similar to what the uh, say. Actually, we we talk to the field guy or the geo engineer, see what kind of the stuff they want, and what what which is useful for them in the daily. So that like say in the morning call, six a.m. every single morning, what they looking into. So we build that for them. For example, let's say one of the use, very useful. Visualization for the geo engineer on the field guy is actually the 3D plot. So that actually is a simple. It's just like you had the plane well pad as a green light, uh, a blue light, and then you had the actual survey plot as the red. And then every time when a new survey coming, they will plot again that one and take them so the geo engineer or like the field guy can see visually where the well geo, how deviate from the the, the how deviate from the well plan well pair and what's the different what's the what's the deviation something like that so that's our in our in another article, that's our favorite plot and another one is the connection time uh for let's say that's another very useful uh information for the junior engineer for example every single morning or like the junior engineer or junior manager they will always come to the the connection time with the hopefully, let's say we have 17 uh, rig, and then they will plot again each of them, see which one is the best one in the past 24 hours. And if they have spy for this connection time, then they will just screenshot the, the UI and send to the rig and see what, what happened. So that really help us to drive the efficiency and in, in, in reduce the connection time. And also for the connection time, we also have something like the leaderboard. <laughs> Actually, it's like for the same rig, if it's with us for five years, and then we will get the history data, and then we we calculate the history data again, the current one. And then for the same rig, rig we will always see the chain of how it's doing, uh, let's say regarding the connection time, or like even for the for the whole free, like, or the, for the same company, or like the neighbor during, we will have the same, all the neighbor during week uh, uh, connection time or different KPI together and, and plot in the same plot and then so the during team or the during manager can see how performance look like so that when that's something they won't they, won't, they, they if they decide uh, in the period of the extend the contract or renew the contract they see which one doing good which one doing bad so actually to be honest for the, I I always the uh, art marketing as a real time during analytic system, but a lot of time it's like real time analysis plus the historic data analysis do the benchmark it is the most powerful tool for the during team. So you you will have like let's say past ten or five years data, use the same model to generate the result and plot again the real time. Then they can see that okay for this week, uh the same pack if it already do four well and this is the fig well, how the how the chain of the five well look like? Is it coming down, coming up, or is, or is the plateau? So that they can see the, the how performance of the the rig doing, and and also the same period of the the, the year or the this quarter or past quarter, they always can combine the historic data and and with the real time data and and, and see the 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 chain and make the decision that we call the data driven. That's actually yeah. So that's my comment. Back to Mark. Okay, okay, great. I think it's a great time here for a poll. We have a couple of polls, so I'm going to try to launch a poll. And Jade, 
if, if I fail, can you can you come in and take over control? Oh, it's it's there. Very good. And so the question is, do you think automation can beat the best directional driller? And so the attendees can go onto their screen and click uh, uh, yes, no, or the all of the above. Yes. Yeah, the result it looks like it's like the ball is has seventy percent of the ball. The number three and number one, yes, it has thirty percent. And uh, no, actually it's just one percent. So actually, that's a that's a very obvious result. Yeah, you can see from here. Okay, so the from yes, yes, from the first poll we have uh uh. uh Two thirds of the people saying uh, that it's going to be a combination between an automated system and human, the human uh, directional driller that's going to be performing best. Uh, excellent. Uh, very, very good result. Uh, we have a second poll uh, here that's uh, also very interesting, I think. And Jade, can you help us get the second poll up and running? What do you see as a current role of directional drillers? Kelsey, you talked a lot about change management. This is a perfect one for you to to, to watch and uh, expound on. All right. So ideally, we wouldn't want our directional drillers to be artisan because that would lead to variation in results that we would see. Um, you'd have different opinions, different ideas. So in my opinion, I would currently lean towards the current role of a DD being more of like a technician slash data clerk, even though I don't really like the wording of, of those descriptions. Um, we ask a lot of our directional drillers, we ask them about expertise, data entry, data tracking, reporting, failure discussions, optimization. I mean, you name it, those, those, uh, men and women out there that are directional drillers have to be on point most of the time with information or with, uh, yeah, with information that we're asking of them. Um, so for us with our remote center, we were very aware that um, those directional drillers are our best tools that we have. We want to leverage their experiences. We want to leverage their knowledge. Um, and so we, we want to take their artisan tendencies and, and use that in our remote center. So we want to use the fact that they're centrally located in the remote center, which is, allows for them to have a two-way fluid conversation, also sharing that experience with other directional drillers in a centralized location so that we're continuously improving um, and optimizing our operating procedures that's ultimately driving our efficiency and content, content bleh, our efficiency and consistency so that our operations are getting leaner and leaner as we go. So in my opinion, I see them as optimization experts. That's what I like to call them. Um, they go in, they execute a plan using their skill set and they're sharing that skill set across a wider, a wider uh, area. So using the same DD with multiple rigs allows that directional driller to get more exposure, resulting in more learning compared to what they previously had. So if you think about it, we're actually making our directional drillers better by having them in a remote center because they're running two to four jobs depending on the area. They're drilling multiple curves. Um, and so you're kind of expediting that knowledge gain. Very interesting. Uh, the the results of this is about 60% uh, of people uh, on, on the on the webinar here agree with you on the technicians, but there's still uh, about a quarter of the people who like the the current role or see the current role of traditional drillers as uh, as as artisans. So it looks like there's uh, still some uh, change management uh, to be done. 
Mm-hmm. And, and and Kelsey, I'm I'm looking at the questions here, and there there's one that sort of follows uh, along with that, and this is about uh, the the software tools and technologies evolving. But when I listen to you, I, I sort of think that it's not so much a software uh, tool issue as it is a communication issue, a trust issue, uh, people working together. Type uh, type issue uh, as a major challenge. Um, so I think there's challenges across the board. Uh, even so, with change management, with software development. I mean, right now, if you're if you're using one system, it might not plug into another system, and so we're having to kind of figure out ways to create workarounds. Um, for our remote center because a lot of the tools that we're finding out now were not necessarily built with remote directional drilling as an idea. So I think, in my opinion, um, what we need to do as an operator like Chevron with us working with our business partners is we need to tell them this is the direction that we're thinking about going because a lot of times um, um, a lot of times the, our business partners are putting in money into areas where they think uh, it'll help us without actually knowing 100% where our minds are, if that makes sense. Um, so I think having like clear, transparent communications as an industry would help us be more efficient as an industry. Okay, uh, very cool. We're we're coming up. We have uh, we have less than ten minutes left, and there's a, a great question from uh, from Darren that I'll also address to you, Kelsey, and that is like, well, what results are you really seeing? This all sounds uh, uh, great, but uh, uh, what are the the metrics? What are the business improvements uh, that you've been able to achieve? So we have seen improvements to our on-bottom ROP. We've seen improvements to our so total cycle time. We've seen improvements to lessons learned being shared across. Um, so the way that sh uh, MCBU is kind of set up is we have area teams. So if you're drilling in the Midland Basin versus the Delaware Racin Basin, for example, we're seeing lessons learned being shared across those fleets because you have directional drillers all sitting together in the same room, kind of talking about um, different ideas, what they've seen in the past, and sharing that knowledge. Um, and so, I mean, we've, we've definitely seen a lot of improvements over the last, the last, I guess now it's a year, I can't believe it's a year. Um, but yeah, we're, we're expecting to see more and more improvements, especially as we grow as a remote center and learning how to optimize what we're doing, working with our business partners to understand where their limitations are now and how we can kind of go in with a laser focus to address those issues that they're having and help them get better. And I mean, connection times, we're seeing- I did not connect. hear you. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I I thought that you were you were paused. What I, I'm interest, What's interesting to me is I did not hear you say less directional driller cost as being one of the major uh, benefits you've seen. So it's really about performance improvement as opposed to a pure uh, reduce the number of uh, staff and therefore stay save labor cost type type move. Yeah, we never went into this with the idea of demanding. We were more of how do we get the right people in the room to help us drive consistency and repeatability so that we're able to predict our our targets. Very interesting. So I see that we have uh, uh, like five minutes left. Could, could I ask you both to give, uh, if you had to, to give the quick elevator pitch about why the, the attendees should be excited about this analog to digital into directional drilling type type progress we're seeing. Uh, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, Jin Zhou to go first. 
what what's your uh, sixty second elevator pitch on why this is such an exciting opportunity? Uh, I uh, sorry, I can you repeat the question? <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, so, so you're talking to over a hundred people here. Why should mm -hmm. they be excited about about this uh, this opportunity? Okay, from the I will talk about from the data science perspective. You can see that okay in the in the AI domain, we almost made a the vehicle auto driving, right? So we believe may, may some some people may be saying that I might, my statement is wrong, but we think that Turing is more simple, Turing in the ground is more simple than a vehicle driving in, in, in the service. So if we can make that happen in the, in the road, the vehicle auto driving in the road, we can make the rig auto Turing in the ground. That's I feel, when I think about this, I feel very exciting. So I think everybody should feel exciting. That's my, that's my statement, yep. Mark. Great. And and Kelsey, can you finish us up with uh, why the over 100 people on the call should be excited about this opportunity? So I think people should be excited about remote directional drilling because we are giving people back their lives. If you think about directional drilling in the past, it was men and women spending months, not, if not years, away from their families. And we have the opportunity now to truly lean into remote directional drilling across the board and, and give people a different lifestyle. Sometimes I like to compare it to the, the automobile, automobile industry back 100 years ago, because there's a, there's a lot of change resistance too, because when the, the car was first being built back in the the uh, 1900s, people were like, oh no, the blacksmith is gonna go out of work. We're not gonna have any more horses. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of questions about, well, what happens to a directional driller in the future? Is the directional driller just gone and that, that's a job that's lost? Um, but if you, if you look at the parallels of directional drilling right now with what we went through with the, the car industry 100, year ago, 100 years ago, the car industry became huge. I mean, before that, we didn't have paved roads. We didn't have restaurants. Hotels and motels became um, an industry. We, we didn't have drive-in movie theaters and things like that. So if you think about what we're going through right now, technological changes cause productivity growth. And pro productivity growth lets us produce more with what we already offer with less resources, which lets us create or even free up spending power so we can create new things that create demand, creating new jobs and new industries. So to me, it's a really exciting time because we're watching that change happen before our eyes. And I think a hundred years from now, we're gonna look back at ourselves and say, I can't believe we used to have directional drillers or MWD on location. And, and I think that the sky is the limit for us right now. And Alan Kay said it best when he said, the best way to predict the future is for us to invent it. And right now we're inventing that future. Boy, that's, that's a great thought. And with that, there are still many questions. So it so, uh, looks like we could have gone on speaking about this, but our time is up. So I'd like to bring uh, Jade back in to talk about what uh, the participants can expect uh, coming forward. Hi, uh, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks, Kelsey and, and Dingzel, for um, some really interesting conversation there. Um, unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got all your questions, and um, if you uh, want more information on the topics discussed, um, we will be sending out the recordings um, within the next week or so. Um, and you can also come to the Data Driven Drilling and Production Conference on June 16 and 17 in Houston, Texas to hear more from our speakers and to the rest of our community. Um, to learn more, you simply go to www.upstreamintel.com data. And 
So with that, thanks again to Mark, Kelsey, and yourself for participating today. Um, I'm sure you've all found that insight invaluable, um, and thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.